Good morning, everyone out there. The numbers of new infections with SARS-CoV-2 each day across the US are terrifying. And ultimately we know as a scientific community that our most effective countermeasure against this virus will be a vaccine. In the wake of a tsunami of vaccine development efforts is a tremendous and less publicized effort to develop the absolutely essential animal models that will support the down selection, improvement, and immunological dissection of the most promising vaccines. The momentum in this field has been furious and the data are mesmerizing. What we will hear about today is some of these efforts. We will see the translatability of the disease across animal models. We will learn how these data are being used for vaccine approval and finally learn how computational biology and artificial intelligence is being applied to these data to accelerate the pace of vaccine development. We have four speakers who will be here today, both to present and answer questions. The first speaker will be Dan Baruch, the director of the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a professor at, medical, uh, at uh, Harvard Medical School. We have Mandy Martino, an assistant professor in pathology at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. Anthony Griffiths will then present. He is an associate professor of microbiology at the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratory at Boston University. And finally, we will hear from Doug Laufenberger, a professor of biology of biological engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We look forward to these four presentations and we look forward to seeing all the questions and having some vibrant discussion at the end of this session. So please use the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom meeting, post your questions, and we will be sure to raise these questions with the speakers. So if we can move to the next slide, we will have our first speaker begin. This is Dan Baruch, take it away. Thank you, Galit. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. So what I'd like to do today is to give an update of where we are in the development of both non-human primate and hamster models for COVID-19. Uh, I'm not going to discuss specifically uh, vaccine studies, but the underlying work, as Galit mentioned, in the ability to test vaccines is the development of animal models. Groups around the world are developing many different animal models for COVID-19, including the development of small animal models, such as hamsters, ferrets, and mice. Although with mice, uh, since they don't have a compatible ACE2 receptor, the choices are either to use ACE2 transgenic mice or to use wild-type mice with a mouse-adapted virus, as well as large animal models, such as rhesus macaques and cinnamalgus macaques. We published our first study in the development of the Reese macaque model about a month ago. Uh, and then I'll show some hamster data that is not yet published. In the development of the Reese macaque model, we started uh, with 13 Indian origin Reese macaques, aged six to 12 years old. And we did a dose titration in nine animals with 10 to the six, 10 to the five, and 10 to the four PFU of virus. The virus was administered uh, both intranasally and intratracheally. In addition, with four additional animals, we did necropsies for histopathology on day two and day four uh, to get an insight as to the pathology of infection. And Mandy Martino in the next talk will talk about the histology and the histopathology of infection from these animals. Virus in BAL and bronchoalveolar lavage uh, representing the lung was seen in nine out of nine animals following, uh, following infection. Uh, virus generally peaked at day one or day two following challenge and then declined by day 10 to 14. We also observed virus in nasal swabs that uh, again peaked at around day two following challenge and then had a bit more prolonged decline so it became negative around day 21 to 28. Interestingly, there was a significant increase in the virus and nasal swabs between day one and day two, particularly in the lower dose groups, such as in group three, indicative of virus replication. So this truly represents replicating virus in the macaques and not simply clearance of input virus. We also measured immune responses in these animals. Here we show the development of antibodies in these animals by uh, a spike-specific ELISA 
Um, and uh, this, this measures binding antibodies, which were seen in all nine animals by day 35. We also measure neutralizing antibodies in these animals here with a pseudovirus neutralization assay. Very similar results were obtained with a live virus neutralization assay. So by day 35, nine out of nine animals raise a neutralizing antibody response. Very similar amongst the three groups at about 100. With Galit Alter, uh, as well as additional colleagues, we also measured uh, antibody uh, subclasses and function. And basically, infection in macaques gives a broad base antibody response against uh, rece the, the receptor binding domain, the full spike, and the nuclear capsid, multiple different subclasses, as well as multiple different functions. We also measured T cell responses in these animals, and uh, spike specific T cell responses were measured in the majority of these animals uh, by day 35. In the four animals that we necropsy, we looked at uh, levels of tissue virus. Here, we observed high levels of tissue virus. Here, each plot represents one animal, two animals from day two and two animals from day four. In all four of these animals, high levels of virus were seen in the upper airways, as well as in the lungs, uh, as well as in the draining lymph nodes, the paratracheal lymph nodes. However, much lower levels of virus were seen in distal lymph nodes and spleen, uh, and moderate levels of virus were seen in the GI tract and some other solid organs. So this is primarily, but not exclusively, a pulmonary infection. We then ask the question, do rhesus macaques that have recovered from SARS-CoV-2 have immunity against rechallenge? A critical question for humans as well, uh, for which data does not yet exist in humans. In other words, if an individual is infected with COVID-19 and recovers, are they then uh, resistant to rechallenge? Obviously a critical question for vaccines, as well as a critical question for public health strategies. In the animal model, we can attest this very directly. The nine animals in the original infection study, plus three additional naive positive control animals were then re-challenged with SARS-CoV-2 on day 35. We use the same dose as the, in the original infection study. So the group that received 10 to the sixth received 10 to the sixth, the group that received 10 to the fifth received 10 to the fifth, and the group that received 10 to the fourth received 10 to the fourth. And what we observed uh, is that there was a uh, very uh, uh, strong protection against rechallenge. So here we show the viral loads in bronchoalveolar lavage uh, with a primary challenge and following rechallenge. And there was really just no comparison. Uh, there was almost no virus there following rechallenge. There was more than a five log decrease of virus. In addition, in nasal swabs, uh, using a subgenomic RNA, we also showed that there was a, a very minimal virus seen following rechallenge, so more than a five log decrease. So in the rhesus macaque model, we conclude that rhesus macaques infected with SARS-CoV-2 show high amounts of virus in the upper and lower respiratory tract and pathologic features of viral pneumonia. This recapitulates many features of SARS-CoV-2 infection in humans, but I should emphasize the rhesus macaques don't get sick. So this is not a model of severe clinical disease. Uh, none of these animals developed clinically apparent pneumonia, although they did have pathologic pneumonia. None of these animals developed respiratory failure, and none of these animals died. So the rhesus macaque model is a very good model for testing immune responses and protection against infection and virus replication, but is not a good model for testing against severe clinical disease. Uh, we also showed that SARS-CoV-2 infection induces robust humoral and cellular immune responses and protects against rechallenge, demonstrating the proof of concept of natural protective immunity. So to help balance uh, the strengths and the limitations of the macaque model, uh, we also developed a model in hamsters. In this model, we used Syrian golden hamsters. In our first study, we used 20 animals that were 10 to 12 weeks old. And we did dose titration of two different doses, what we call a high dose, which was five times 10 to the five TCID 50, and a low dose, which was five times 10 to the four TCID 50. And the dose was 100 microliters delivered intranasally. Uh, the plan was to necropsy four animals in group one on day two and four animals on day four, and then follow eight animals uh, uh, longitudinally. So then all the animals were then followed through day 14 following challenge, and we looked at weight loss as well as viral loads. So here are the results of the weight loss. Uh, you can see that both the low dose and the high dose resulted in profound weight loss uh, as a result of clinical disease. So the hamsters, unlike the macaques, developed severe clinical disease, particularly for the high dose infection, 
uh, you can see that the median, the, 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 the median weight loss was 20%. Um, so I put in, just to keep the numbers clear, I put the numbers in, in small numbers to show you how many animals there were. There were four animals in the low dose group. They dipped by about uh, 10 to 15%, and then they all recovered by day 14. In the high dose group, we started with 16 animals. There were four scheduled necropsies on day two and day four. And again, Mandy, in the next talk, will show you the pathology of infection in those animals. And then the goal was to follow those eight animals from day four onwards. But what happened is that four animals met euthanization criteria on day six and two more on day seven. So we truly have a severe disease partial lethality model here. So here are the individual uh, weight loss in the animals that receive the low dose infection on the left and the high dose infection on the right. And uh, in our institution, the euthanization criteria for humane euthanization is at 20%. So you can see the animals that exceeded this weight loss uh, uh, counted as mortality. And so there are only, of the eight animals we attempted to follow, only two actually survived, but those two did recover and recovered almost fully by day 14. So here's the, the survival curve uh, showing a profound difference between the low dose and the high dose infection. We also measure tissue viral loads at the scheduled necropsy time points at day two and day four, as well as in the animals that did meet euthanization criteria on day six to seven. And we see profoundly high amounts of virus in the lungs as well as in the upper airways on days two and four. Interestingly, the virus is already lower on day four than day two. And, um, uh, and is actually two logs lower by day six, seven. So even as clinical disease progressed, then the virus already was starting to come down. So the, so, so the clinical disease was not fully explained just by virus replication. But in addition to virus replication in the, in, the, in the lungs, then we did see substantial amounts of virus in other organs, such as the heart, the GI tract, the, the brain, the spleen, and the liver. So if, um, if the virus is already declining by day six, seven, when we saw maximal clinical disease, then why did the animals get sick? And we believe that it's actually an inflammatory response. Um, uh, in the next talk, Mandy will show you some of the uh, histopathology for this. But just as a summary, uh, you can see in panels A and B that the days following challenge, uh, as you go from days two to four to seven, the amount of virus actually declines. But as you can see in panels C through F, um, then the inflammatory markers continue to go up. IBA1 positive cells, CD3 infiltrates, MPO positive cells, and MIX1 expression continues to go up from day two to day four to day seven. So basically these animals die initially triggered by a profound uh, virus replication, but then that appears to trigger an inflammatory response. So to conclude in the hamster model, high dose SARS-CoV-2 infection in hamsters leads to severe uh, disease, including severe COVID-19-like disease, including severe pneumonia, weight loss, and partial mortality. We believe the hamster model complements the non-human primate model, which does not lead to severe disease. And both models have strengths and weaknesses and pros and cons. And therefore, we believe both models may prove useful for studies of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, therapeutics, and pathogenesis. I'll stop there. I uh, acknowledge a large number of people involved in these studies. Um, and here's a picture of our group in happier times uh, uh, last fall. We hope to get back to this as soon as possible. And we think animal models are going to be key for developing countermeasures. I'll stop there and hand it over to Dr. Mandy Martino. Thank you, Dan. Andy, while you're grabbing your slides, maybe I can just mention to the audience, please put your questions in the Q&A window, and we will be sure to read them out loud to the entire audience um, at the end of the four presentations. So with that, Mandy, are you seeing your slide okay? I am seeing my slide. Is everybody else seeing my slide? We're seeing the alveoli. Okay. Well, that's fine. That was uh, that is the first slide. So we'll just go from there. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to present to you today. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing uh, some images uh, looking at the comparative pathology of human COVID infection and, uh, and showing you what we're seeing in uh, two animal models that we've looked at so far, uh, the rhesus macaque model and the hamster model. So just to get us started, um, just a reminder, 
that um, SARS-CoV-2 um, is a uh, interstitial viral pneumonia that leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is implied in the name. Uh, this is similar to other coronaviral infections such as SARS and MERS, and uh, all these infections um, start with infection of the respiratory epithelium and tend to affect mostly the lower respiratory epithelium, including the alveoli. So as you can see here, we have type 1, uh, type 2 pneumocytes that become infected, and uh, what happens during this infection is these cells uh, do start to die. Uh, this uh, viral replication induces a response uh, from the periphery. <clears throat> periphery, excuse me. Um, neutrophil chemotaxis is induced, uh, so these neutrophils start to arrive by the bloodstream, they move into the interstitial space, and eventually go into the alveolus. And this damage um, and the loss of these um, alveolar uh, lining cells leads to a repair process uh, that is uh, demonstrated here by this hyaline membrane. And this is really a pathognomonic feature of uh, SARS pathology in humans and in animals. Now, most of what we're seeing in uh, COVID-19 patients is unfortunately from autopsy specimens. And in human medicine, um, SARS uh, pathology and acute respiratory distress syndrome is really defined as having two phases. Uh, there's the acute, acute phase, which I've just described to you just now, and then also this more organizing phase, which is seen by uh, organization of this uh, edema fluid within the alveolar um, uh, space and an influx of more macrophage type cells and repair if possible. Can everybody see my mouse okay? Just wanna make sure that that is sharing. So the question that we asked is um, whether we can see, I am not advancing, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're, oh, there. The question is whether we, uh, we can actually see any of these features in the animal model. So just a few pictures of what we do see in the autopsy uh, images. So these are from um, our collaborators at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. These are autopsy specimens from, from uh, human patients. Uh, uh, achieved from a fine needle aspirate study. And so here you can see evidence of hyaline membrane formation in the alveolus. Uh, these alveolar uh, spaces do have a lot of viral protein, which is indicated here by the SARS nucleocapsid protein staining by immunohistochemistry. And indeed, we can also see lots of viral protein showing up here by an in situ hybridization study. And could you advance, please? Uh, some of the more unique features um, that are seen in uh, human autopsy specimens that we believe may indicate a unique feature of, of COVID pathology is the development of vascular pathology that may be explaining some of the severe clinical syndromes and, and disease in these uh, human patients. So one of those features is something called endotheliitis. Uh, this is a, a seen here. Um, basically, the, the endothelium becomes inflamed and uh, cells marginate along the endothelium. It can also, inflammatory cells can also be seen here in the interstitial space. Uh, they were able to show by doing an ultrafine sectioning method of two microns, actual microthrombi that were developing in the alveolar uh, septa, as you can see here. And so these, uh, these are features that are seen in late disease, and we wanted to know if we could find evidence of that in the non-human primate model. Thank you. So most, many of these images have already been published um, in our recent manuscript, and you can see evidence of alveolar edema and diffuse interstitial pneumonia in some of those images. But I just wanted to reiterate that we do see this interstitial pneumonia. And as Dan mentioned, it is very patchy, and this is not a diffuse process in the monkeys. The monkeys do not become sick from this disease, but we can see lots of virus in the interstitial space, as indicated by this in situ hybridization. And interestingly, um, we do find evidence of some of these other features that are being described in the COVID patients, uh, namely this uh, inflammation and margination of all these inflammatory cells along the endothelium, this endotheliitis, and you can see many uh, nuclei here and inflammation surrounding the vessels. We also find evidence of microthrombi within the alveolar septa, as seen here. And we do see evidence of this pathognomonic uh, feature, the hyaline membrane formation in the monkeys. And again, these are uh, more rare events in the monkeys, but they are detectable. We also see evidence of epithelial syncytial formation in the bronchial epithelium. And this is more of a reparative process. These cells are really trying to repair themselves and, and uh, replace the damage. Um, typically, these cells are not vi uh, virus positive, so they're not traditional viral syncytial cells as seen in some other, some other viral infections. We can occasionally find virus in them, but not frequently. More often than not, um, what we're seeing is a very strong positivity in alveolar lining cells, which are consistent with the pneumocytes, and we've actually
actually gone on to, to phenotype these as indeed epithelial cells. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to take a closer look at some of the vascular changes in these monkeys. And so we did some, um, some special stains. This is a Verhoff and Giesen stain that allows us to evaluate the elastic fibers of the endothelium. And you can really appreciate here how uh, this side of the endothelium is normal, but on this side, we see this proliferation. And there are too many nuclei within uh, this, this area indicating that these are inflammatory cells that are sort of moving through from the, the, the blood into the, the vessel wall. And we can also appreciate at this uh, endotheliitis along the, uh, the margins here. Uh, it's again seen here and here in three different examples. Uh, next slide, please. But we, we've been looking for evidence of this uh, prothrombotic state that's been described in humans. And so, as I mentioned, one of the, uh, the differences in the COVID pathology in people is the development of severe thrombosis that's being reported in the clinic. And we asked whether we had any evidence of this in our non-human primate model. And these are images from as early as two and four days post-infection. And uh, this is a special stain that allows us to identify uh, fibrin. We did, the, uh, my fabulous technicians at uh, did this ultra thin two micron sectioning that allowed us to look for this. And you can see the fibrin is in this very bright uh, magenta color here. And it is organizing with these platelets, which is the classic definition of a thrombus. So this is within a vessel, uh, but we can also see microthrombi developing within the alveolar septum, uh, very similar to what has been described in human autopsy patients. And again, you can see uh, fibrin deposits uh, building up along the, the vessel endothelium uh, locally here. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to switch gears and now show you some, uh, some of the unpublished data from our hamster model that we've been developing. As Dan mentioned, the monkeys are great for looking at um, uh, immunology, um, but they do not develop uh, the severe clinical disease that we're seeing in human patients. Uh, the hamsters, on the other hand, are profoundly susceptible. Um, we see uh, uh, a lot of inflammation starting very, very high up in the respiratory epithelium. We can already see evidence of inflammation in the nasal turbinate epithelium indicated here. Uh, the bronchiolar epithelium is, is absolutely destroyed by this virus. Um, we see severe, severe necrosis and sloughing of, of epithelial cells into, lum, into the lumens of the, the bronchioles. Um, this is a collection of uh, neutrophils and cellular debris from this infection. Um, in addition, we also see evidence of an endotheliitis. So you can see here's a vessel and there are inflammatory cells lining up and marginating. So both of those features are present in the hamsters to a much more severe degree. In most cases, um, 30 to, to sometimes 80% of the lung specimen is affected by this inflammation um, at the peak of inflammation. So here's an example of that classic interstitial uh, pneumonia. You can appreciate the consolidation of the lung and the complete loss of functional airspace. Um, when we look at each of these levels of the epithelium in the respiratory tract, we can see a lot of virus positivity. So here we see lots of uh, viral protein in the nasal turbinate, um, likewise within the bronchiolar epithelium and within the slough cellular debris within the lumen of the bronchus. And additionally, this interstitial pneumonia with many, many positive um, uh, pneumocytes that are showing up positive within uh, the, the pulmonary architecture. We can also de demonstrate, uh, this is done by um, Jacob Estes' group at um, Oregon Health Science Center University. Uh, this is viral RNA showing up in the interstitium and also within the bronchi. And as Dan mentioned, um, the clinical demise in these hamsters is really coincident with this profound uh, inflammatory response that really peaks at about seven days post-infection if you know and we often this is at uh, t the time point when many of these animals need to be um, euthanized humanely so here we can appreciate the massive infiltrate of macrophages and i will say that we see so many macrophages and neutrophils in the lungs of these animals this is iva1 we do see some t lymphocyte infiltrates but it is much much less compared to the neutrophilic and, and histiocytic response in these animals so I think that's all I have for you. To, oh, one more slide, please. <laughs> and then again, Jacob Estes' group has done a very, very nice job of showing uh, longitudinally uh, the viral replication in tissues. And so here we can see uh, the antisense and sense probe of an in situ hybridization assay. And um, here the sense probe really shows you the active viral replication. And as Dan mentioned, um, the peak of virus is at two days and it starts to decline um, over seven days. Um, and this uh, viral replication is coincident with the expression of um, the receptor 
receptor for the virus, um, the ACE2 receptor, uh, as seen here by immunohistochemistry. And um, that, that is the last slide. I think I have a summary slide. Next. Thank you. So in summary, um, because of the, the fact that this is a severe disease and, and patients are often on respirators, um, uh, we really do not have very much data on the acute pathological events of this, uh, this disease in humans. Um, and we really absolutely need animal models to try to investigate these early events and potentially identify points of intervention. So the non-human primate model does recapitulate key features of the pathology. This is seen as early as two days following challenge. We see this uh, patchy interstitial pneumonia. These animals are clinically fine, but within those regions, we find evidence of vascular endotheliitis and endothelial reactivity. Um, and we can see evidence of early uh, prothrombotic state with fibrin deposition in both vessels and airways. So the, the non-human primate model is very useful for studying the mild uh, SARS-CoV-2 disease in immunology that is probably affecting um, most individuals. Um, while the hamster model really models this, the severe pathological outcomes that are, that are seen in people, and this model may be very useful for testing some early therapeutic interventions and um, also vaccines, we hope. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, just thank everybody that has helped and Dan specifically, I can just advance to the next slide, um, for uh, the opportunity to do um, all the pathology work on these studies. Um, of course, the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research and all the folks there, Biaqual, um, definitely want to acknowledge Jacob Estes' group at um, OHSU, and of course, um, our fabulous histology team at Tufts Cummings School, including uh, Dr. Uh, Pedro Mora. Uh, thank you. Can move to the next slide. I believe the next presenter is Anthony. Not. Okay, so uh, thank you for the invitation. The, the title for this talk is Alternative Pathways for Licensing Medical Countermeasures. Is there a role for animal rule with SARS-CoV-2? And the short answer to this talk is right now, no. So, so the, the reason there isn't uh, a, a role for animal rule right now is that we're uh, hopefully uh, on, on the end of the middle of the pandemic, but certainly the pandemic is, is raging hard still. So on the left, we have uh, an image that's taken from the WHO's website last week, I think, and it's the number of confirmed cases reported in the last seven days by country. And clearly there are large parts of the world that, that have a high number of cases uh, uh, that are occurring over the last seven days. However, things can change. On the right, we have an image of the daily new cases uh, per 100,000 people in the US. And uh, I, I outlined Massachusetts in red, which peaked a little while ago, but there has been a precipitous drop in the number of new cases. So, so things can get better, uh, but but how does that change uh, with an effective vaccine? Clearly, for a, 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 an efficacy trial that uses humans, one needs individuals who may become infected in the context of a vaccine. We're obviously going to have uh, uh, less possibility of, of, of looking for um, uh, individuals that may become infected. So. We've been addressing this sort of problem in the biodefense field for a number of years. And, and in this sort of context, our group works on a variety of pathogens, uh, Ebola virus, Marburg virus, Sudan virus, Nipah virus. These are all viruses with high case fatality ratios. They have unpredictable outbreaks, and those outbreaks are typically small. So it's difficult to perform efficacy evaluations uh, in, in humans. So how does one license a vaccine or a therapeutic against an agent where it's unfeasible to perform efficacy testing in humans. So there is a parallel here to how we may need to license possibly vaccines, but, but really likely therapeutics as we have uh, efficacious vaccines that come online for SARS-CoV-2. The way that the FDA in the US has decided to approach this is the animal rule. Now the animal rule may permit licensure of medical countermeasures in the absence of human efficacy data if evidence of efficacy in an animal model is available. But this can all change. So, so for I don't know, best part of 10 years, a number of groups worldwide were, were trying to push 
Ebola virus medical countermeasures and vaccines in particular uh, through to licensure via the animal rule. But there, there as you probably know, were two large outbreaks. Uh, and the second outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo allowed for human data to be generated and the, the, the animal rule data was sort of pushed to the side and Merck were able to license uh, an Ebola virus vaccine based on the human data. So th this, really, th this really does show the need to be adaptable as, as the situation changes. So just a, a high level um, slide showing the, the regulatory mechanisms for traditional approval, there's a discovery in a preclinical phase, then the clinical trials. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase three is where most of the efficacy data are generated. I, I put as, a, as an aside that uh, human challenge data are being proposed uh, in a number of different contexts uh, as, as a way to increase the, the speed toward licensure. Uh, I'm not really talking about, I'm not going to talk about that here. Animal rule is different. Um, animal rule has the same discovery and preclinical steps but the clinical trials uh, step is altered. So we have phase one and phase two that are still required for animal rule studies. But the, the, the animal efficacy studies substitute for the phase three part. So th there is at least in theory an opportunity to, to save some time with animal rule. But again, animal rule can't occur uh, if traditional approvals are, are feasible. But, but the animal efficacy studies can occur in parallel to the phase one and phase two. So there is an opportunity to save time. There have been a number of, of medical countermeasures licensed by the animal rule, 20 in total. Uh, uh, but they're, they're clearly in the biodefense field. Uh, I, I highlighted in yellow a few. Uh, we have nerve agent, cyanide, uh, anthrax, plague, um, uh, radiation syndrome, smallpox, those are all drugs uh, against those, um, those insults that, that have been licensed by the animal rule. And there have been a handful of vaccines that have been licensed by the animal rule too. But it, it, it's really not seen as an easy approach to getting licensure. Uh, there are four essential criteria that must be met for licensure via the animal rule. And, and I paraphrased from the guidance and the link to the guidance is shown at the bottom. But the four criteria are as follows. There needs to be a reasonably well understood pathophysiological mechanism in humans and that, that the, um, there is prevention or substantial reduction of that pathology by the product in animals. That effect is demonstrated in more than one animal species and colloquially this has historically been known as the two animal rule. Uh, and those animals, both of those animal species are expected to react with a response that's predicted for humans. Alternatively, the, the effect can be demonstrated in a single animal species, but that single animal species represents a well-characterized animal model. So there needs to be a close recapitulation of human disease in that animal model for a single animal species to be, to be considered. The animal study endpoint is clearly related to the desired benefit in humans, uh, and certainly in the biodefense realm, that, that's often survival. The pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the product, uh, and those data can be generated e from either human or uh, animal studies, allow the selection of an effective dose in humans. So some considerations uh, for licensing via the animal rule. Um, it, the animal rule differs from the good laboratory practice regulations. However, the GLP regulations are followed to the extent possible. So really the animal rule leans on the GLP regulations. For example, one may choose to have qualified and validated assays. One needs a quality assurance unit. Data is shared in a particular format with the agency. Uh, if electronic records and signatures are used, one needs to be part 11 compliant. And this is by no means a complete list. On the right is, is an area that, that our group has spent a lot of time considering uh, in the um, biodefense field. What, what is the challenge agent uh, that one needs to use for the, the animal studies? Or for that matter, the human challenge studies? What variant does one use? The, this, this is particularly relevant right now. Does one use the D614G variant or does one use an older variant? The, the history of the virus, the provenance is very important. 
uh, remember these data would be going to the FDA, so there needs to be a trail of documentation associated with the isolate and the, the, the past virus. How is the virus amplified? It, it needs to be done in a way that there is minimal impact to the, the, the virus uh, biology. Should one use a clone? That This has been debated a lot uh, in, in the biodefense field. There, there are advantages to using a clone. It, it allows for identification of drug resistance much more readily. However, clones don't necessarily have the same biological properties as, as a mixture of viruses. Should one use a, an adapted virus? Would a mass adapted virus be adequate? Uh, the, the, they're not questions for which I have answers, but they're certainly questions that need to be considered when, when one's considering an animal model. What animal does one pick? Mouse, monkey, hamster, ferret? I think we've seen great data to support uh, a number of these. What is the route of infection? Ideally, what one would want to mimic the natural route of infection. Does one try and mimic a large particle delivery? One, does one try and mimic a fomite? Does one want to target the deep lung with an inhaled small particle? Then what dose does one pick? Uh, again, it's one's trying to mimic a natural exposure. Uh, and not only is the dose a tricky question to consider, how does one quantify the, quantify the dose that, that, to which the animal is exposed? That can be a particular issue uh, with inhaled small particles. Uh, what is the time to onset? Does the disease mimic the human disease? What is the time to onset? What is the progression of the disease in the animals? What are the manifestations? Typically, one would rely on a natural history study uh, in an animal model to pr uh, provide a baseline uh, to look for the effect of an intervention. What is the degree of morbidity seen in that animal model? This is a really interesting one to me. The, the, in, in the biodefense field, we've been, uh, we, we typically uh, use uh, lethal models of disease, whereas Ebola is 50% lethal. Should we be using a model that uh, recapitulate, recapitulates that lethality? Uh, and it, it's clear that in monkeys, SARS-CoV-2 causes a mild disease. Well, that recapitulates fairly accurately the disease that's seen in most individuals. Should we be looking to model the mild disease or the more serious disease that's seen more rarely? What is the trigger for intervention? Uh, often that's, that's time post-infection, but there are better parameters that should be considered if possible. So that, that, that's really all I had. Uh, I, I was encouraged to mention that uh, the, the group at the needle is working to validate uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, assays to assure that animal models are ready uh, for animal rules should it ever be needed. And I'll pass it on to Doug. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, so what I'd like to present in a few minutes uh, here is uh, how can we deal with the challenge that we're facing of translating information in the studies uh, from animals uh, to humans to take the terrific animal work and glean as much relevant information from it uh, to uh, guide us with humans. And this, is, and this is difficult because it's clear that the relationships between molecular data that might be underlying uh, phenotypic uh, physiology and pathology can be significantly different for humans compared to rodents or non-human primates. Uh, what current approaches do is focus on commonalities. What's in common between humans and the animal models with respect to genes, protein cell types, uh, with respect to disease and treatment. But this has limitations, of course, otherwise the clinical trial success rates would be much higher than they are. So uh, let me just uh, illustrate here uh, what, uh, what we have in mind. So the way things work right now is to take observations of animal molecular cellular uh, data and relate it to the animal phenotype uh, response to the infection, response to a vaccine, and try to match up as well as possible the commonalities between the human molecular data and animal molecular data that then might be able to be related to the similar human biology. Uh, because of the limitations in this, uh, what we're proposing is to use computational systems models to uh, comprehend the data in a much more uh, complete way. So now, uh, in, instead of just the observations, we can construct a computational model that relates in the animal 
the molecular cellular data to the phenotype. And then based on that model, we humanize it by altering the parameters so that it more effectively relates to the human biology. And that tells us uh, how what's observed in the animal is likely to be uh, different in the human. So we're humanizing a computational model as opposed to humanizing the mouse uh, model, for instance. Uh, I'll quickly uh, explain the premises for this, and that is it's, it's well known that any particular explanatory molecule, a specific gene or protein or even cell type, does not necessarily translate well across species. Nonetheless, we believe in mammalian biology that mechanisms should translate across species. Uh, another problem, though, is that there's likely to be multiple explanatory mechanisms. There's rarely just one single mechanism that is responsible for the outcome to an infection. And in different species, these will have different quantitative contributions. In primates, it may well be that certain aspects of the innate response are more important, and in the human, certain aspects of some adaptive uh, response are more important. And one has to account for those different contributions. So the idea is that we can infer the explanatory mechanisms from the computational models, and then to translate between animals and humans, what we have to do is figure out how to modulate the weights of the different uh, explanatory mechanisms as they might become increased or decreased between animal and human. Uh, the kind of models we're talking about here are on the left-hand side. In the end, we want to be able to understand or predict uh, physiology, pathology, uh, response to treatment, somehow characterizing the kinds of uh, observations that Mandy and uh, Dan showed. We want to be able to develop those models in terms of molecular explanators, whether it's transcriptomic, proteomic, and so forth. Uh, so to construct those models, there's a variety of different uh, mathematical frameworks one can use. Uh, mainly uh, data-driven models or machine learning are most valuable uh, these days because of the complexity of all the interactions going on. Uh, let me give you just one example in, in two minutes for a demonstration of how this can work. So what I'm showing you here is uh, this is a compilation of uh, 36 different case studies where uh, people in the literature have tried to uh, compare transcriptomic data in mice to transcriptomic data in human for different types of inflammatory uh, diseases, sepsis, burns, trauma, endotoxemia, and try to understand what the commonalities were uh, between the mouse transcriptome and the human. So what's shown on the left-hand side is plots on the x-axis of mouse gene expression in any one of these 36 case studies. Only some of them are shown here. And on the y-axis, the corresponding human gene expression. And the question is, what are these differential gene expressions? Do they correspond well? If they do correspond well, are they actually predictive of the pathology in human as well as they are in the pathology in mice? And you can follow up and read a lot of papers that have disagreements about how well these predictions work and how well things that were learned in the mouse for any one of these cases actually translates. So with this case study, we've uh, applied our uh, methodology, taking the uh, mouse uh, uh, relationships between transcriptome and pathology, uh, relating differential expression to uh, disease versus healthy. And instead of trying to directly apply it to the human, we construct a machine learning model for it. And then in applying it to the human, we modulate the parameters to figure out which of those parameters have changed that are, then have to be more representative of human than mouse and how are they different. For the methodology, we're using artificial neural networks. You may be familiar with these in concept from image processing where people might want to take image pixels and decide whether they're more likely to be a cat or a dog. So the input variables are image pixels and what happens is the neural network model gives you latent variables which are weighted combinations of those pixels then it takes those weighted combinations and fits parameters that classify cat versus dog. So then you would come in with your new data and it'll work through this and figure out what combinations of variables contribute uh, the weight to getting the right prediction. We're gonna do the same, but now our predictor of measurements are transcriptomics in this case. And from the gene expression measurements, there will be weighted combinations of those forming the latent variables. And those combinations will be multiplied by parameters to then relate to disease versus healthy. And the trick here with species translation is we first do this, we construct this model on mouse data. 
We construct the input-output relationships and figure out the latent variables of mouse transcriptomics and their contributions uh, mechanistically to disease versus healthy. And then uh, we modulate the parameters in that model to reflect the human data, uh, similarly to as we've shown here. And this allows us to account for the differences and not focus solely on commonalities. What one gets is the result that many of the molecular predictors for human diseases in the matched data sets are very different than those for the comparable mouse disease. What's shown here on the x-axis uh, in a particular study are the mouse uh, differential gene expression and the right and the x, uh, y axis is the human gene expression. And what's shown on the right is the weightings of different genes then in predicting the human biology versus mouse. And what you see is there's only a small number of those that actually are held in common with the mouse, these right up here. But many of the strongest predictors would not have been observed directly as strong predictors in the mouse, but the changing of the weighting coefficients uh, in moving from mouse to human pulls them out. Consequently, this allows you to find biology that's dysregulated in the human that you wouldn't have observed directly from those mouse uh, transcriptomics that were in common between human and, and uh, mouse. So here in red is uh, depicted uh, the processes and pathways indicated in the mouse models for dysregulation with the inflammatory pathologies. What's in black is uh, true human biology. What's in blue is how that red mouse data then gets transformed by the mouse model to become predictive of human data. And you can find many, many pathways and processes that in fact are dysregulated in the human disease, but would not have been found from, from the mouse. So uh, we're new, moving now. Uh, we've been working on multiple uh, applications with this. We've got uh, uh, three other papers that uh, you can find uh, uh, published. Uh, and we're now moving it to vaccine development with Dan Baruch and Galit Alter and colleagues with the same notion that explanatory mechanisms should translate. There just might be different quantitative weights of contribution. The names of the specific molecular and cellular players might be different, uh, but we might be able to help discern this by the computational modeling interface to understand the differences between animal and uh, human uh, immune responses. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Okay, well, thank you, Galit. Um, so we have time for uh, a few questions. We'll try to get a question, we'll try to get some questions for everybody on the panel. Uh, so first for, for Dan, um, there's some questions about potential other uh, uses for animal models. Um, I, have you tried the model transmission or has anyone? And also then the question of whether um, transfer of serum passive immunization um, can, be, can be tested in the animal models. Yes, absolutely. Um, I didn't have time to describe all the uses for the animal models, but they can be used for many different types of uh, either basic research studies or interventional studies. And uh, our group has uh, done studies looking at both monoclonal antibodies for prevention or treatment of SARS-CoV-2 infection, as well as polyclonal antibodies <laughs> taken from uh, uh, convalescent animals. Um, and so, so there will be a lot of data emerging for the use of the animal models for both monoclonal antibody and polyclonal antibody um, uh, prophylaxis and treatment. And for example, those studies can be used to define what titers of antibodies are needed for protection. Well, first to define that vaccine-induced antibodies or monoclonal antibodies, there's some monoclonal antibody data already, but one can look at uh, the titers of vaccine-induced polyclonal antibodies that are needed for protection and to get a quantitative number, which might be useful in guiding the clinical uh, vaccine development program. Oh. This is Andrea. So then a question related to that is if there have been studies on passive transfer of antibodies or dissecting the role of uh, antibody and T cells in, uh, in protection in these animal models. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure if anything's been published, but uh, I, I can say that, that we have done, or we are now doing studies on both of those. We're doing studies both with CD8 depletion uh, to look at the role of CD8 T cells in SARS-CoV-2 infection, as well as studies on uh, passive transfer to see whether antibodies in fact protect. The correlates are certainly an antibody correlate of protection, but formally one cannot conclude that vaccine-induced antibodies protect until one does an adoptive transfer study. And so those are both underway and we would, in a few weeks, we should be in a position to report those. So Mandy, are there uh, megakaryocytes in the lungs of the infected macaques and hamsters as has been seen in human samples? Uh, yes, actually, we do see that in um, both of those animal models. Um, the megakaryocyte question is a bit tricky. Um, so we know that this is a common um, response in many, many inflammatory processes. And so we've started looking back through our SIV and Zika affected animals to see if there's evidence. And we do find it a lot of times. And so we need to come up with a quantitative way to try to assess that and how it might be related to the pathogenesis. But we are looking at that. So there is also a question, uh, you know, both for Dan and uh, Mandy around the, you know, the, the challenge. And one of the I would also is, you know, this is a high viral uh, load, you know, our, our, you know, high virus challenge. And so the question is, uh, if there is, a, um, if the pathology in hamsters is driven by the inoculum or replicating virus, and of course how that relates to the real infection. Uh, Dan, do you want? I mean. We do know that there is less, at least in the hamster model, there's less pathology with a lower inoculum, um, but we do see feature, the same features of the viral replication, the epi, bronchial epithelial necrosis, the interstitial uh, pneumonia is present irrespective of a high versus low dose, um, just the severity. Whether that's, um, I, you know, I, we haven't done formal studies to look at um, the uh, viral replication kinetics um, in a larger study looking at a low dose, but, um, but the pathology is there in both cases. Uh, Anthony, uh, so can you review again what, what, the, what situations might lead to the need to use a t uh, the animal rule um, for licensure? I, I can imagine some. I, I, I think if we had an effective vaccine the, and many people were, were vaccinated, there, there are going to be less people available for, for efficacy trials of a, of a drug. So a couple of years down the road, um, that, that it may just not be possible to test a, test a drug. Maybe a question also for Doug is uh, in terms of, you know, for the, for the modeling, so in the context of a vaccine program, uh, what kind of data would be, uh, you know, are necessary to, to build the, you know, the computational model that can translate from uh, animals to uh, humans? We're working on two different types at this point. Uh, with Galit um, on uh, system serology data, uh, antibody uh, profiling, and uh, some immune cell functor, uh, function activities. Uh, we've, uh, we feel optimistic that we might be able to uh, uh, gain insights and translate things from one animal model to another animal model and uh, understand uh, how it'll change with, uh, uh, with humans. And uh, with Dan's lab, also some uh, transcriptomic data uh, that can be analyzed uh, differently. You get different types of uh, insights from the different types of data. Uh, so um, uh, there can be cytokine data, of course, too. But uh, really where we're starting is the system serology data. We, we have a lot of optimism that we'll get uh, really good insights by modeling that. So, uh, question for Mandy. Um, if, when compared to other respiratory viral infections, do you see unique, distinct pathologic features um, with SARS-CoV-2 in these animal models? And, and also what, what sort of the parallel is, is what really causes the, um, the coagulation problems? Um, I think that we're all trying to answer that question and we're um, uh, working with um, Dan uh, and Malika uh, doing some transcriptomics to look at the thrombosis question. I think that that's still 
uh, an answer that needs to be addressed. Um, in terms of other uh, respiratory pathogens, there's uh, clearly a lot of overlap. Um, I personally do not have um, a lot of experience looking at um, animal models of influenza, so I can't speak to uh, the comparative pathology of coronaviruses and um, influenza viruses head to head. Um, but, um, but I think that the, and of course we do see endotheliolitis and uh, perivascular inflammatory reactions in a number of animal models for any type of viral infection. That's a very common reaction. I think the unique thing here is truly this early thrombotic state. Um, and it's one of those things where if you go looking for it, uh, maybe we would find evidence of that in other, other models. Um, but, uh, but looking at these uh, early fibrin death position uh, in the lung of the monkeys is really profound. I mean, we, we would not anticipate seeing that based on the few number of true thrombi that we're identifying. And so I do think that's something to look into more. And we are looking at that um, with a number of different methods. So can you, can you stick your neck out and make some predictions about what's causing it? Well, I can, I, 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 Dan, do you want to answer this? This is really Malika's paper, <laughs> um, at least in the monkeys. Um, but basically we're seeing, we're seeing, um, we're seeing evidence of a transcriptional response that's looking at complement activation um, and a really profound uh, activation of, of, of macrophage populations, at least in the monkey model. And so we need to, to look at that uh, more thoroughly. Um, as I said, we're starting with a transcriptional response um, and it needs to be backed up by other, other studies and we're in the process of doing those things. But uh, we have evidence for, for complement activation and macrophage activation as contributing to this. Another question maybe for Dan. And, um, so if uh, one is when the animals are really, you know, the infected animals were re-challenged and if you have done any studies to look at persistence of the response in, uh, after infection in, uh, in, in these animal models. Yeah, the durability of the responses is a critical question. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that has not yet been addressed uh, rigorously in the animal model. Uh, we're starting to do some of those studies. It's hard to do in infected animals because once they're infected, they're in BL3 containment space. And logistically, it, it would be very expensive and difficult to have them inside a BL3 containment suite for a prolonged period of time. Uh, so, but it can be done with vaccines, and it is being done with vaccines. Uh, so, so I think that over the next number of months, there will be studies both in humans, uh, many studies from humans, as well as studies uh, from vaccines and animal models to look at durability of uh, the antibody responses. Completely a critical question for both uh, pathogenesis and public health, as well as for uh, vaccines. So we're, we're, pa we're past the hour, but um, just a quick question for Mandy. How does the pathology track with the symptoms? So um, obviously the monkeys have very mild symptoms. And um, I think there was a question um, from Dr. Walker about the, uh, the monkeys. And so it is very, very mild and uh, very few areas of the lungs are severely affected, but, but regionally it can be quite, quite severe. So we don't see any correlates really with the, um, the non-human primate model. Um, in the hamsters, um, as Dan mentioned, uh, the peak of the inflama inflammatory response really seems to be at about one week, and that does correspond very, very nicely with um, morbidity in that model. So these animals are having severe weight loss, um, and they are losing pretty much all of their functional um, lung capacity at that point, which explains why, uh, why they're losing weight and why, why they need to be euthanized. Maybe one last question, if and then uh, I don't know if we are too close. But is a, uh, I think it compares them with other uh, actually respiratory disease. And, and one question is that I'm going to read is uh, when compared to other respiratory virus infection like severe flu or others, do you see unique uh, distinct path uh, pathology features uh, related to SARS-CoV-2 in these animal models? Have you? I don't know if you had the chance to look into that or have done some work in, in the past. Yes. Dan or uh, uh, so I have we have not looked at influenza um, at all in my in my lab, but um, but there probably are some overlaps there. But uh, clearly, this is much more severe. Um, I think the ferret model is used quite extensively for flu, and um, we I haven't looked at this personally. 
I mean, there is a big difference, both in severe influenza and severe COVID both give a pneumonia, but um, severe influenza does not give the same uh, extent of thrombotic uh, and um, vascular complications. So there are going to be some similarities and some differences. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers for for great talks, exciting talks, and and thank you to the audience for all of your questions. Uh, Galit, do you have any more closing comments? No, thank you. That was a wonderful symposium. All have a great day. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.